but you're there in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, and the title of the sermon this, this evening is Renewed in the Spirit of Your Minds. We're still in the beginning of January, we're still, uh, you know, getting started. But one of the things, you know, this is a great message to, for not the beginning of the year, as far as like goal setting, but it's a great message for after the beginning of the year, when you've dropped all your goals and your resolutions. Because the challenge is, and I'm not being negative, is the reality is most people are going to drop all their resolutions like January 2nd. You know, like come January 2nd, that's it. They've already like not eaten healthy. They already missed. And I think that's one of the mistakes that the U.S. makes, you know, just with all this self-help and, and all this motivation stuff is that, you know, they, they don't tell you that life is not perfect. And so you, you set the schedule and you, you're in the holidays and some are better than others. But, you know, you got, you got every day planned out in January. You're like, January 1st, I'm going to start and I'm going to eat healthy and I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to be nice to my wife. And, and nothing's changed from December 31st to January 1st. Right, and the challenge is then you fail, and what ends up happening now you're depressed, and you give up, and then you start resetting the days. What you ought to do is you, I, I believe you should have goals, but it, they should be small goals, and they should be you know achievable. But anyways, it's not a goal setting, but it is. This message is is really for those that have already run into a bunch of stumbling blocks. You know, we're we're two days away from the 15th, and people are like, oh, halfway through the first month, which technically is the 17th, but you know most people won't look at it like that. And what you should do is, the Bible is always instructed us to renew our minds daily. You know, it's, this is a daily thing that we need to look at. And so what I'm going to do today is, let's focus there. It's in Ephesians 4, verse 22. And the title again is, Renewing in the Spirit of Your Mind. And we find that there in Ephesians 4, verse 22. It says, That ye put off, concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the, the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's so already we're getting good instruction because right here the Bible's teaching us that we need to put off the conversation of the old man. You know, it's not just enough. It, it, the, putting off the old man is easy. You know, if, if I'm in a group, actually that's why you should come to church. You know, if I'm in church and we're having a, a godly conversation, it's really hard for my mind to think about lust or, you know, pay back or whatever it is that your mind does you know I, I i'm as a man obviously you you focus on the things that men tend to do but women maybe the gossip or the murmuring or the things that are going to happen but it says but what ends up happening is if you're alone what's the first thing your mind starts to do it starts to have a conversation with you you know you're nobody's crazy until they're reprobate because we all kind of have a little bit of a conversation with the old man all the time right you're like man i'm i'm I, it's january 1st but there's still some good old turkey and gravy and pudding and yeah, I got to eat all of that. And, and you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. And your mind's like, yes, you are going to do it. It's just one day. Because you know what, really? I mean, you want to be on a 30-day cycle, right? So January 1st doesn't count because you want to do start January 2nd so you get 30 days in. You know, that's what we do. And, and what I'm going to do today is give you nine things that we can do in our day, in our, day, in our life daily and they're not difficult things. We find them here in these verses on how to renew the spirit of our mind. You know, so, you know, we're going to find them there. But let's go back to Ephesians 4, 17. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over to unto lasciviousness, to work uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as in truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversations, the conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So it's not just that you're lusting, but it's the lying lust, right? The devil's always going to lie to us. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that steal, steal, uh, stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor, 
working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to them that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And so we see that these are the nine verses that we're going to focus on. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible, and, um, you know, if you're a project manager, that's why I think the Bible's great, is, you know, you can go through it. There's a lot of if then scenarios, but then there's also a lot of checklists. And I, and I really believe uh, wholeheartedly, because I believe the Word of God 100%. That the checklists are in a specific order for that reason. God doesn't do things willy nilly. You know how sometimes maybe you make a checklist. Have you ever done that? You make a grocery list. You didn't think it through, and so you end up over there in the milk aisle, and then you got to go from the milk aisle all the way, to, and you ended up with the ice cream, and now you got to go put the ice cream back in the freezer, and then go back and do everything, and then you're going to pick up, and then you forget the ice cream, and now it's all over. You know, God doesn't do that. He's not going to have you running around like that. He's going to make sure that you get things done, and. What does it mean to be renewed? Well, you know, the, the definition of the word renew is just to begin or to take up again. So it's not just to take up again, as we think, but it's to begin, right? As an acquaintance, as a conversation, resume, to make effective uh, for an additional period, to restore, replenish, to make or say or do again, to revive, to reestablish. Then the reason I cover these is because the Bible says that we're going to renew, we're re renewed in the spirit, right? And there's two ways we're renewed as in we're born again, but then we're renewed as in we're taking it up again. We're making sure we're living in the spirit to recover our youth or our strength. The Bible talks about, you know, just uh, being young and, you know, being fortified and being renewed to restore, to rejuvenate uh, to a former state, to make new or as if new again, to begin again, to recommence or to renew a lease or note, to be restored to a former state, become new as in as if been new again. And so, you know, one of the things that we, we know is this, the, it's a, an easy concept for us as Americans to understand because one of the things that you see in America more often than in other countries, you do see it everywhere else, but Americans are famous for this, is memberships. I mean, everybody wants a member. You're either part of the AARP or Costco or Sam's or the Book of the Month Club or, you know, some sorority or... Uh, fraternity or you're an alumni to this or you're part of this club or you're basically we know what it is to be in a club and and then to let that go and to renew that again and whether you know we're, we see that go to actually stay there in Ephesians and then we're going to be in 2nd Corinthians but I'll read for you Titus 3 Titus 3 verse 1 says put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready to every good work to speak evil of no man, to not to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which was shed on us abundantly through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is the faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now it's not talking about works for salvation, but now you're saved. This is talking to the believer, saying, look, you got saved, so be careful to maintain those good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a, an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And so we know that a membership, you know, it's just a separated group with privileges that others don't have, right? Now, when we get saved, we don't have to pay that membership. We don't have to do anything but believe that membership has been paid by Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a debt that, you know, it's like if I gave somebody a Costco membership and I paid for it, you know, you get the privileges for free of that membership without having to pay for them. Now, you'd have to renew, so then, you know, but, and so I'm not even going to make that example, but when we take on memberships, we get these privileges, right? We're a separated group, and that's what God's saying. Look, you're not just renewing 
because you're saved, but you're renewing because there's benefits to this. And if you don't use them, you're going to lose those benefits. Now, you'll get to heaven because salvation is completely free. You don't have to do anything to get in heaven other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's by faith. It's uh, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But there are benefits to that, to being elect. You know, that's another word, right? If, if, I'm, if I have a Costco membership, I have an election that others don't have. And I can take advantage of those. You know, what are, and, and I don't, by the way, I'm not promoting Costco. This is not brought to you by Costco. I just happen to have one. But, you know, you get to, maybe not, not everything that you buy there is cheaper in price. But for the most part, you get better offers. But the other thing, you get to buy in bulk. You know, you get, you get stuff that other people don't get. They have exclusive deals. And then one of the things that people love about Costco is you can take anything without a receipt and return it. Right? You can't just do that at any other store willy-nilly without having to put up a fight. And so there's all these advantages. I mean, and I'm pretty sure they have all these benefits written out. I don't care. I'm just giving a good example, right? And, you know, you have, uh, a, you know, all these organizations. You have memberships to clubs and spas. Right now there's memberships to the, I'm pretty sure, that L.A. Fitness down the road. And it's packed. Around March, it's not going to be packed. And so then those people are just losing that benefit to use that equipment so they don't have to buy at home to be able to, you know, get a better health. But let's go on, and I'm going to keep this real simple. You know, we're just going to look there in Ephesians. We're just going to go down those verses, and the Bible actually goes on to explain what he, what the Bible, what Paul is saying here, and uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of what it is to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Because it all has to start up here, in order for you to take action. I learned a long time ago by a business guy that all you could control in your life was your attitude and your activity, right? But it's interesting that it's in that order because most people won't take action unless they have the attitude to take the action. Even when you don't feel like doing something, you have to tell yourself, I don't feel like doing this, but I'm going to do it anyways, right? You know, you don't, sometimes you don't feel like going to church or you don't, you have to do this, but how do we go through that process? You know, some of us might do it subconsciously, but we get it from the Bible. You know, the first thing we see there is in Ephesians 4.24, it says, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And although this might at, at the beginning sound like a self-help, I don't believe in self-help. Because the Bible says that the heart is wicked and deceitful who can know it above all things. This is God's help. You know, you can't renew the spirit without Jesus Christ. You can't renew the spirit without God's word. And he says, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a creature, new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now... Then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, hath made, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the first thing, obviously, if you're going to put on the new man, you've got to have the new man. In order to renew the new man daily, you've got to be saved by grace. I mean, that, that should be pretty simple. And you should say, really, you want to include that as a point. In today's day, in the day we're living in, that's the most important point. You know, one of the things that I've realized is I, I, I try to not be repetitive in my preaching. You know, I try to learn new things. And, but one of the things that we're going to have to do as the time draws near, which is getting here, is this is going to have to be repeated. That salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Because there's wolves creeping in that are preaching all kinds of damnable heresy. All kinds of things to destroy the free gift of salvation, the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Look, you're not a new man because you got up this morning and you, you convinced yourself that you're better than yesterday. Look, that's the world's thinking. That's called humanism. You're a new man because Jesus Christ saved you. And remember, you're still a sinner even when you put on that new man. You know, God became sin for us. Jesus Christ, right? He took on the sins of the world on the cross and then he was buried he went in hell for three days and three nights, and then he rose again. Now he sits on the right hand of the Father. Obviously, he, you know, I'm not gonna, he was on the earth for 40 days, you know, the witnessed of uh, 500 disciples. But that is the gospel message. 
You better get that right if it's not right. And because there's a group of individuals everywhere preaching that wrong. It starts with the Joel Falsteins of the world. But you know what? Those are the ones that are easy to spot. But then there's others that creep in that are even worse. You know, I mean, we used to have, and Pastor knows, I had fellowship with a guy out of San Antonio. He helped us, uh, you know, when we were the soul. The guy's preaching all kinds of heresy. But then he goes around saying, look, salvation is by grace, this and that. But, you know, if you listen closely, it's kind of scary what he's preaching. Right? Those are the things that we need to be careful for because we want to put on the new man. You know, I'm not going to go into that right now. We'll, we'll touch it on another service because I want to stay on track. But the second thing we see there in Ephesians 4.25, it says, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You know, the Bible is clear. God hates lying. So stop lying. Number one, put on the new man. And you know what's interesting? If you're putting on the new man, you better stop lying to yourself because you know when you drop the ball. Own up to it and then put them on again. Right? You know, I mean, it's pretty simple. You just, we just got to do what the Bible says. It says, wherefore, putting away lying, the Proverbs, you don't have to turn there. You know, just stay in Ephesians. I'll tell you when to turn out of there because I'm going to just jump around in a couple of Proverbs. But Proverbs 6.16, this is a famous set of Proverbs that we, we probably, most of us know. These, thi these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and to run into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now, I, why did I go through all of those? Because it, lying is part of that. You know, lying can lead to a lot of things. The Bible is actually, it's interesting the way the Bible words things, because God's truth is so much better than our truth. Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. You know, one of the things that we learn in this world, the media is very quick to jump on people for hate speech. But you know, hate speech is a lie of the devil because we have to hate certain things. The Bible is saying here, a lying tongue hateth those that are, are afflicted by it. So they're being hypocrites because by the fact that simply the fact that they're lying to you, what are they doing? They're hating you because it's afflicting you. You say, okay, hate speech might not, you know, that might not always be a lie. For the most part, when the media says it, it is. You know, if I get up and I say pedophilia is punishable by death, they say that's hate speech. That's a lie. And what, are they, what, are they, what does it say? It says, hate it, those that are afflicted by it. You know, they affect our lives by censoring us, by doing, by attacking us, by attacking our faith. And what does that do? That means that that tells me that they hate me. And then later, later on, another way of lying says, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So when someone goes around and is telling how great you are and what a great preacher you are and how much Bible you know, you know what they're doing? They're trying to ruin your life. And it might not just be in ministry. You know, I just, ha I just had it happen in business. You know, one of the, my main client, at least he was clear about it. Actually, I appreciate the fact that he just cut me off and told me he hated me for whatever reason it was, right? But some of the, the other individuals involved kept saying nice things to me, but their actions spoke differently. That's a flattering tongue, and it leads to wrong. Those are actually the ones that affect you the most. Look, I like it when, you know, if a Satanist came in here, it'd be easy to spot, right? He, he loves Satan. We love God. Go on our merry way. You know, you know your damnation. But it's the one that creeps in and sits there, and then when you walk out, tells you different things. That you're, you know, says, man, that was a great sermon. I really agree with that. But then behind your back is lying or looking to destroy you. Just like the Pharisees. Remember how they talked to God, the scribes and the Pharisees? Oh, you're a great master. You're a rabbi. You know so much. You would never do wrong. And then they were always trying to entrap them, right? So we got to put on the new man. So we first make sure we're saved. And then once you're saved, that's the only way to put on the new man. There is no way to be a new man unless you're in Christ. And number two, stop lying. I mean, the order might not make sense to the world, but it makes sense to God. The second thing he says is, look, just stop lying. And that's one of the hardest things to do. You know, people, when we go through the salvation message, we're like the abominable and the hallmarks and the hate. You know, we go through that and then we say, and all liars. Sometimes they kind of look at you like in shock. People don't think of lying as a big deal, but lying is a huge deal. God hates it. 
He mentions it over and over again because it does hurt the people that you're lying to. Even a white lie, as they like to say it. There is no such thing as a fib. Or a lie is a lie. Amen. Period. You know, the Bible says in uh, verse 26 of Ephesians 4, which is point number three, don't stay angry. Now, I'm not telling you not to be angry. I'm just telling you don't stay angry. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Look, we get mad sometimes. The Bible is clear that sometimes there's things, Jesus got mad. You think he was like happy-go-lucky when he went into the temple and beat everybody up with, you know, a whip? No, he was angry, right? But he didn't let that wrath go down upon him. You know, you got to let things go. And I'm not just talking about the end of the year let go. You got to let things go today. I mean, I don't know what you got angry about today or yesterday, but just let it go. You know where this affects the most? In your marriage. You know, I didn't mean to, but right? I mean, women and men, you need to go to bed not angry. You're like, oh, that's really hard. Do it. Because what ends up happening is you know those couples. You either know them because they're family members. You know them because they're friends. You know somebody who they've built up all this bitterness and this just brooded bitterness towards the other person because they kept going. They'd wake up with that same anger. Or you've met people, right, that haven't talked to each other for years. And you ask them, why don't you talk to each other anymore? And they're like, I don't remember the reason we got in a fight, but I ain't talking to so-and-so and they, because you let that anger go. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, 32, it says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Look, it's, it, it's, we're, the Bible says we're more than conquerors. When you take the city, you're conquering. The Bible says we're more than conquerors, but we need to be slow to anger. Colossians 3, 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And then what are the members? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the, on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walk sometime, when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds." And I've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You know, you've got to be able to move on. Right now, what's the political thing? Let's touch, we'll touch a little bit on everything. Everybody's like, man, I cannot believe that Trump incited a riot on January 6th. He needs to be impeached. Wait a minute. We don't know if he incited it or not. But regardless of that, and I'm not defending Trump, let's just talk with the facts. Are we so quick to forget that there was riots and upheaval and destruction of homes and businesses and lives last year and that didn't but you know what it is it's because they they dwell on that anger they dwell on that covetousness they dwell on that inordinate all of that all, all the things that are, are talked here they're just dwelling on it. they're just sitting and brewing and brewing you can't remember you know when you're really angry is it is it ever your fault when you're really angry no your wife's like you know you're fighting or you know it doesn't actually my wife and i we, we do get, don't think, take it wrong, we do get in arguments. We don't, it, I can probably on one hand count the times we've gotten in like shouting matches. You know, we get angry, which I'm grateful for. But I remember being a young man with my brothers and sister in the house. And, you know, you could get into some shouting matches. And it's always like, but you did so and so. And then you just sit there for a second, you think about it, and you find the reason why, why you're angry at them, right? And it's their fault. No, but you did so and so, remember that? And then it just becomes this tit for tat. You know, you just... You're just, so don't stay angry. And I'm not against being angry. You know, I'm angry at a lot of things. This, this nation makes you angry. Some of the decisions that are being made from our leaders, I mean, you'd be, I'd be shocked if you weren't angry. Honestly, I'd be shocked if you weren't angry. I don't even care about social media, but when do we get to a nation where corporations now censor what you can say or not say? Right? I mean, that should make you angry. Now, I know it's their business, and I'm for private business, but when did it become where the government 
is bought out by big corps. Well, apparently when, 2021, just I mean, you write it down on your, that's, the, that's when it happened. But don't stay angry at that. Plus, what are you going to do? You're going to focus on it all day? You're going to let it brew all day so that you can do nothing about it all day? Because how much money do you really have to go against GoDaddy or Amazon or Google or the IRS? I mean, really, that's the fight you're going to pick? The fight we need to pick is the spiritual fight. That's why the Bible says renew the spirit of your mind, right? We're renewing the mind because it's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. You know, they're getting ready. The military apparently is in the Washington, in the White House, because they're getting ready for some civil unrest. If Christians are out there, that's about the stupidest, dumbest thing that they could do. They would say, oh, that's, it is. Because the Bible says that's going to happen anyways. You know what they need to be doing if they're Christian? It's going out there and leading those uh, poor souls that are lost to hell to Christ. That's the renewing of your mind. The fifth thing we see, and I've, you guys can count, so we're not that, we're already halfway through. Don't steal. And people are like, well, I haven't stolen anything. Look, don't even steal people's time. There's other ways of stealing. You know, the, don't steal, the Bible says. Ephesians 4.20 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with hands the things which is good, that, me, that he may have to him to give to him that need it. Look, obviously the easiest form, and this is, we steal, like, don't take things from others. But there's more than one way to take things from others. You know, don't promote things, you know, our taxes are a form of stealing. Now, I'm not telling you to protest your taxes. That's not the battle that God wants us to fight. But if you were to look at it correctly, taxes is a form of stealing. But you know what else is a form of stealing? Fees and regulation and red tape and, you know, property tax. And you know, There's other ways of looking at it. And the reason I'm focused on this is because we need to not be involved in those things. People build businesses around that. You know, there's, there's predatory lenders. There's predatory businesses that take advantage of people. That's stealing. You know, I mean, and I'm not, like, honestly, I'm not patting, but you've got to have the fear of God. We were at the grocery store the other day, and, you know, you do the stupid self-checkout, and we were doing Doritos, and then we had Cheetos, and I think the price difference was, like, 20 cents, and somehow it rung it up twice to where it was in my favor. And, you know, Mary said, I mean, obviously she didn't do, we weren't thinking, she was just like, let's go, there was a long line, let's not, I couldn't even leave. I had to get the lady to come back and make sure she charged me the extra 20 cents. But it wasn't because I'm Mr. Self-Righteous. So I just felt the fear of God. I was like, man, I don't want to walk out of here and God hold me accountable for stealing. That's really the truth. The truth is I didn't do it because I'm some kind of high. Look, in the past, I've taken those 20 cents. So let me make that clear. The reason that I do it now is because I can feel that fear of God. Seriously. And you say, well, that sounds like such a petty thing. Well, look, it starts out petty. You know, no grand theft uh, Larson ever started out. With just, he started stealing gum and little things, and then it just escalated. It's very rare that you hear of someone that's like, oh, my first big sin was murder. It, it, didn't, it, it happens, but it's like exception to the rules. I, usually you hear the stories like, oh, well, I started with petty theft and this and that, and next thing you know, it escalated. I was in jail for a long time. Then I committed my first murder. And then it was easy to murder, and then I just became a serial murderer. Something, something ridiculous like that, right? So don't steal. Bible says in Proverbs 30, uh, verse 7 says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them, not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me food convenient for me. Look, if we focus on God, it doesn't matter if we make good money or bad money. God's going to provide for us. And he says, Lest I be fool and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain, of, thy, uh, of my God in vain. Then Matthew 6, 19 says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through to steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Look, over the holiday, somebody actually broke the back window of my car. I lent, you know, we, my, my sister-in-law borrowed the car and she parked in front of a Chewy's over off of 290 somewhere and they, they took my, my brother-in-law's backpack. And it's just such a pain. But you know what? If you don't care about those things because you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, you can move on so quickly. Then you don't stay angry. Then you don't have to lie. You don't have to do any of those things. Let's go on to verse, uh, the sixth point, verse 29 of Ephesians 4. It says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, 
that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's not good enough if you're doing all this stuff. And by the way, this is I'm preaching to those that are saved. I just want to make that clear. Sometimes people, I'm preaching to those that have Christ. You can only do good works if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, none of the good works that people see that you're doing, they're not good works. It doesn't mean anything. It's all vain. But, by, but, but the Bible here says, don't let corrupt communication out of your mouth. So I mean, not just lying, but that filthy mouth. And I don't care how Christian you are and how good you grew up. If you've ever been angry, you've let something out. I'm not saying, maybe there are people that have never cussed or, you know, or cursed or said a curse word. But if you can say certain words with a certain tone, and it might, you might as well just call it a curse word. You don't have to necessarily use what we in today's modern language use as a curse word. Not only that, just the way we use our tongue to edify a brother or sister. And it's hard because the natural inclination is to just want to complain. Look, if I turned on the TV every day and I watched all the news media, man, I'd complain a lot. Taxes are going up. Biden's an idiot. Pelosi's horrible. Trump's nowhere to be, you know, depends on where you want to stay, right? Hollywood's a mess. This and that. And, you know, there's no jobs and all this masks. And, I mean, we could. I could sit here and depress you real quick. You know what? God's been grace, graceful to us. And his mercy endureth forever. You know, I was thinking about it just on the way over here, just before I got here. Our lives are basically an amalgamation of miracles that have happened over our lifetime. There is no accounting that makes up for the fact that we've lived this long and we actually have money in our pockets and food on our table and clothes on our backs and a roof over our head and a car that we drive or whatever it is. And you say, yeah, but I don't have the nice car. You have a car. I don't have the good food. You have food. You know, God didn't promise filet mignon. He just said, hey, I'm going to feed you. And he said, better yet, he said, I'm going to feed you with the good word, right? This is the bread that we need to focus on. Watch your tongue. The Bible says in James 3, verse 5, says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tame and hath been uh, tamed of mankind. So we have dominion over the world. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and, there, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren... These things ought not to, to be. You know, the, a, a good summarization of this is you kiss your mama with those, with those lips. You've heard that before, right? You kiss your mama with those lips. Some guy gets off and he's like, you know, bleepity bleep, 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 bleep. And you're like, you kiss your mama with those lips? I do. It's embarrassing. But more importantly for Christians, you know, we try to watch our language. Over the years, I... I try to not cuss, and actually it's something that I've cleaned up over my life. You know, it's very rare that, that something like that will come out. But, you know what, sometimes our delivery is not the best. Even when we're trying to be nice to someone, right? You know, my, one of my favorite uh, nice deliveries that's actually really mean is, you know, I don't want to insult you, but let me tell you what's wrong with you and everything, right? I don't want to be mean, not trying to insult you right now, but I don't know what you're doing with your life. That's not very edifying. There's other ways to deliver that. There's other ways to talk to people about that. But at the same time, we need to use our tongues correctly because I'm not telling you that you shouldn't be sharp. The Bible talks about a sharp rebuke, but it needs to be towards those that are impeding the cause of Christ. You know, I was out soul winning uh, on Saturday in Mexico, and uh, on Saturday we went to the plaza, you know, where people are just walking around instead of a neighborhood. And so I'm talking to these two young guys sitting in the corner. All of a sudden, like... Uh, uh, maybe a quarter into my presentation, some guy just shows up and he's listening and I'm asking the questions and he's answering them. I mean, he knows the verses. He knows the whole thing, but he's not letting these guys answer. And one of them, one of them actually got saved. He was really interested. The other guy didn't get saved, but one of them was really into it. And I'm trying to give him the gospel and this guy keeps interrupting. Finally, he's like, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. I mean, he's quoting the verses. He knows the, the Romans wrote like the back of his, I mean, he's verbatim quoting everything I'm saying. 
He knows all the answers. And I turn around and he goes, why would God condemn me to hell for the little sins that I do in about 70 years? And he made me so, I was like, why would you even focus on that? That's something you can't control. Why wouldn't you just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fact that there is a plan of salvation, and just forget about the fact that you, you're condemned to hell? He goes, well, I don't believe in hell. I said, well, then what you need to do is let me finish with these guys, and you need to stop interrupting me. That's literally what I did. I mean, that's a sharp tongue. Because the guy was get, got saved, and I honestly believe that he was a stumbling block for the other guy. Because the other, the other guy just wasn't interested after that, that whole exchange. You know, I hope that guy, if he really has rejected the Lord, that he just dropped dead soon. Because all he's doing is impeding the work of the Lord. And you say, that's not biblical. Well, then just, you've never read the book of Acts, right? I mean, Paul, like, blinds a guy. He's like, you're no good to the ministry, so I'm just going to strike you blind. You know, we, we see other examples, but that's probably one of my favorite ones. Because that'd be really cool, right? I wish I could have just kind of like, be blind. <laughs> and that's it. Leave me alone. But I can't do that. So, you know, at least, but you know what I can do? is I can rebuke him sharply. You know, the Bible tells us in Colossians 4, verse 6, says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You know, I love salt. You know what I do love? Natural salt. Not the iodized stuff. Obviously, that was for a different time. But if you, if you get the good salt, man, that, your food tastes great. The older you get, you lose those taste buds, what do you do? You want to salt that, or you want to have that good flavor. You also want to do that with your speech. You know, there's nothing more edifying than a good sermon. And I'm not talking a good sermon like it's great in speech. A sermon that preaches God's word. If it's hard, or if it's nice, or if it's a little, if it pricks a little, it's still a good sermon. You know, that's seasoned with salt. You know, salt brings out the flavor in things. One of the great things is you can salt something that tastes bad, and then you taste it and taste bad. It's a good reminder not to eat that again, right, for your taste buds. So you want to have that, that salt. Don't lose its flavor. Number seven, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this one's pretty easy to describe. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Well, the, the, whole, the title of the sermon is, you know, I don't want to, the title of the sermon is renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know how you grieve the Holy Spirit? When you don't renew that, that spirit. When you reject that day to day. I'm not talking your salvation. I'm talking the ability to have a blessed life. And it happens. The distractions are quick. You know, I, I was doing my studying and preparation for, for this sermon yesterday. I was just reviewing. And then at one point I was like, you know what? I need to sit down and continue reading. I'm just going to do a little bit more reading. And I grabbed the Bible. And I literally grabbed the Bible. And I was in the sofa. The lamp was on. And I was ready to read. And I got called to something. I got distracted. And guess what? I just never made it back to the sofa. That's what we got to be careful with because it's real subtle. I mean, we can get back on track, but those things are going to happen. And they happen more often than you think. You know, when we live in the flesh, we grieve the Holy Spirit. When we're being carnally minded, we're not being heavenly minded. Number eight, don't be malicious. And this is kind of like a, a synopsis of, ver of verse 31. Verse 31 of Ephesians 4, 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Man, you should, you should hate it. You know, here it uses both. Don't be malicious, but also, I mean, just, what is it? Uh, and I'm quoting this, I'm paraphrasing, but we need to rebel against sin. You know, it, it wants to bring us under subjection, and we need to bring our bodies under subjection to Christ. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, and if you were to read Galatians 5.19, it says what? The works of the flesh. That's probably my favorite set of verses as far as salvation versus works, because people are like, well, what about Mother Teresa, or what about so-and-so that did good? And Those are works of the flesh, because the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, we call that work, right? Love, joy, peace, suffering. But the Bible says, look, you can't even have that without the fruit of the Spirit. That means we're, we're rooted in Christ, right? And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no, no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, 
envying one another. And I mean, it's not just what the world does. Sometimes you're like, man, that guy's a better ministry. Or he's a better... Don't do it. You are who you are. God's giving you, put you where you are for the reason that he has. Be grateful and content in whatever state you're in. You know, one of the reasons that it's easy for me to overcome loss in business or attacks is because that's where God needs me. Period. Some of it might, and I, and I mean, we could, I guess, overanalyze and some of it's chastisement. Somebody could sit here like Job's friends and be like, well, you, you really messed up here. But you know what? The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, right? So even chastisement is good for me, so why do I overanalyze it? This is what, what God needs me to do. This is the changes he's making in my life. Thank you. Now, it sounds real easy when I'm preaching behind the pulpit, but it takes a long time to get to this. And even when you get to this, you know what? You go home after a good sermon or after a good day of preaching, and you have to fight that flesh. You're like, why do I feel like I want to be depressed? Or why do I feel like, like I'm sad? You know, and you just got to get back in the Word and do those things. And then the final thing, and then I'll tie it all together, be kind and forgiving. But I think it's interesting the way it builds up, right? You can't even get there if you haven't removed all the other stuff in your life. It says in Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Look, you don't have forgiveness because you're like really good at talking yourself out of a situation. You know, you ever ask forgiveness of somebody and you could tell they didn't want to and then you kind of convinced them and then they, they forgave you? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to do it. You know, that wasn't my intention, blah, blah, blah. But here, God just forgives you because of Christ. So we just need to forgive because Christ forgave us, period. Luke 13 says, take heed. I mean, Luke 17 verse 3 says, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if you trespass again, against thee seven times in a day, and seven, seven times in a day turn again into thee, say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So basically, I mean, the Bible is setting you up for being backstabbed quite a bit because your brother's messing up, and you're like, look, stop it. He's like, I'm sorry, I forgive you. And then a couple hours later, but you're doing it again. Stop it, I'm sorry, I forgive you. He said, that's kind of, that sounds kind of, we all have that family member. We're like, next time, I'm not forgiving them. I'm not giving them money. I'm not helping them out. I'm not doing any of that. The Bible says forgive. You know better, right? Which, by the way, look, if you, if you know of someone, don't put yourself in that situation. If you know someone's always going to ask you for money, well, then just, it's probably better to separate yourselves from them. Because if not, you're bound to this law, right? If you lend them money knowing they're not going to pay you back, you better forgive them. So, you know, I guess the rule would be if you're going to lend out money, you just don't expect anything in return. That's a biblical rule so that you don't even have to worry because then you're going to walk around just being angry all the time. But the Bible says if we confess our sins in 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I think it's important for also us to ask forgiveness. We've been forgiven our sins, but the Bible does instruct us to ask forgiveness. You know why it's good to ask for forgiveness? Because you humble yourself before the Lord. And that's humbling. And then you can forgive others. You know why you don't forgive people? Because you're prideful. You know why you don't ask for forgiveness? Pride. So look, if you can humble yourself before the Lord, it's a lot easier to forgive others. And you can, you could make comparisons. And we can sit here. It doesn't matter. Look, if we believe God's word, we need to just stop thinking about it and just do it. That's really, you know, I'm going through, uh, you know, I just, I just uh, went back. I have my insurance license for a long time, so I just went back to, you know, doing some insurance sales. It's not, you know, the most glamorous thing in the world, but the Bible just says for me to provide for my family, right? And so I'm putting the time into that, and, and I was going through one company, and they're like, look, don't think about it. Just keep it simple. Less is more. You know, don't overthink it. And you know who they're, who they're saying that to? They're saying that to the old sales guys, right? Guys like me who've been in sales for a long time. Because what do we carry with ourselves? Bad habits. That's what God's saying here. I'm not saying he's telling us this. But he's saying you're carrying bad habits. You were in the flesh once. Now you need to be in the spirit. But don't think about it. You know, because we, we want to overanalyze this. I've heard arguments for a bunch of stuff in the Bible. I don't know if I've heard every argument, but I've heard some good ones. You know, I remember... 
I had guys have whole conversations with me about render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. And, you know, he's telling us not to pay taxes. But then, you know, why do you pay taxes? If you really read it in context, it's pretty simple. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. What does Caesar want? Your money. What does God want? Your spirit. All right? I mean, if you really broke it down, it's pretty simple. But the thing is, we tend to overanalyze. So that's how you get renewed in the spirit. You know, to just a recap, and then we'll close out. Put on the new man. Stop lying. Don't stay angry. If you're married, that's really a, an extra one. That's like a bonus for you. Don't stay angry at your wife or your husband. Resist the devil. You know, it says, neither give place to the devil. Resist the devil. Don't steal. Watch your tongue. Really, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't be malicious. And then be kind and forgiving. I think that order is perfect. You know, God gave it to us. Implement it in your life. Renew today and forget about the goals that you didn't hit or did hit you do this you'll do much better in your worldly goals i'll tell you that you'll do much better in your job you'll do much better in whatever you're trying to do if you just put this to work, good use so let's go ahead and pray heavenly father lord thank you so much for today thank you for the opportunity to just uh, be here and to preach this message and lord thank you for the instructions the simple instructions that you give us in your word and i learned a long time ago simple is not easy simple is, you know, if I decided to exercise, I could exercise every day, but it's not always easy to get up and exercise. But thank you that you don't overcomplicate it. You're not the author of confusion, Lord. And help us to renew the, our mind in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.